Today's Brew Day brought to you by Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. Sierra Nevada is probably one of those benchmark beers, something that almost defines the style of American pale ale. It was probably ultimately responsible for introducing the world to Cascade hops. And believe me, there is a lot of Cascade hops in this recipe. I'm making a 45 litre batch today, and that's going into the brew belt. Now, it's a nice temperature in Brisbane at the moment with the parker on. I reckon the temperature in there is going to be around, it's going to hold nicely in, in those low 20s. Just in case it doesn't, I'm going to hook the glycol up to it. I imagine that once this yeast kicks off, it's going to really kick off. So I want the glycol ready on standby to go just in case that yeast does take off and it starts to shoot those temperatures up. Temperature control is probably the most important part of the brewing process that if you can get it right you're going to see a marked improvement in the quality of your beers. So looking at, let, let's quickly take a look at the recipe for this batch on Brewfather. The Sierra Nevada Pale Ale really is quite a simple but elegant recipe. To make a 45 litre batch, we'll need 10 kilograms of Gladfield's American Ale Malt and 900 grams of Cara Munich 2 from Veyerman. Now I got this recipe originally straight from the Sierra Nevada website. If you go to their website, they tell you to make a five gallon batch. This is your, well they say 92% two row malt and an 8% Cara Munich. So I've, I've kind of balanced that out in the recipe. I'm pretty close to that, but I wanted to hit a specific OG. Uh, so what I did was I entered the numbers in originally. I pressed the percentage sign and I said 92% Gladfield American Ale Malt, 8% Cara Munich. And then I set my OG and just played around with the values a little bit just to, even, you know, just to round the numbers out. Now, if we take a look at the style the BJCP style guide says that it's an average strength hop forward pale American craft beer with sufficient supporting malt to make the beer balanced and drinkable. It needs to be hoppy. It's not as hoppy as an IPA, but you definitely need to have that hop forward character about it. So you need a moderate to moderately high hop aroma from American or New World hops. And in this case, the Sierra Nevada recipe calls for cascade and it's just there are four hop additions but they're all cascade and because of the wide variety of hops that are available to you you can also get a wide variety of aromas and flavors from those hops so you can get citrus or floral or pine or resiny you can get tropical fruit stone fruit it really is up to the hop variety that, that you choose the appearance should be pale gold or amber Moderately large white to off-white head with good retention and generally quite clear. So it shouldn't be a hazy finish. We should have a, a reasonably clear beer at the end. Flavour, again, you've got that hop and malt character shining through with similar flavour components as, as well. And again, because this is a fairly wide open style, you've got a lot of wiggle room to play with here. ABV is 45 to 6.2%. If you look at the Sierra Nevada cans that I had, they were 5%. And I think that has to do with the Australian tax rates, the, the, the rates that you get charged with for various strengths of alcohol. Uh, but most Sierra Nevadas that you see overseas that, that in the can or the bottle are around that 5.6%. And that's certainly what was on the recipe from Sierra Nevada. So that falls fairly well in the middle of that 4.5 to 6.2% ABV. OG, we're looking at anywhere from 1045 to 1060, FG 1010 to 1015. Now, if you look to the, the bars on the right, mine's I've set it up 
so that the OG would be 1055 with an FG of 1012. And that gives me an ABV of 5.6%. So that's what the, the Sierra Nevada recipe was calling for. Um, the, the EBC in the style guide is 9.9 .9 to 19.7. Mine comes in at 18.5. So towards the, the top end of that, IBUs 30 to 50. This one's around 38. Again, I, I don't think it should be as hop forward as an IPA. This is an American pale ale. So I've gone for a, the, the lower end. And again, this comes from the Sierra Nevada recipe as well. The, the additions that they're adding at the alpha acid percentages that they've specified bring you to 38. So I've stayed with their recipe. It's a 60 minute mash with laudering and a sparge. And when we get to the boil, it's a 90 minute boil. The first edition is at 90 minutes, second edition at 60, third at 30, and the final one, they say it's zero, but I'm going to add mine in at the hop stand. So I'm going to, I'm going to drop the temperature down to 80 and then hop stand that final edition just to bring through a little more aroma and flavor. Now, when we look at our salts and water, the, the salts are listed there. I've gone for mash salts only, no sparge salts at, at, for this recipe. But looking at the water, if we go in here, we're, we're fairly heavy on the, on the sulfates, 283 parts per million. And calcium's up there as well, 110 parts per million. Everything else is, is fairly well balanced. Strike temp for this is 72.2. Two, we'll round it out to 72. Uh, temperature is 68, and it's just a straight 60 minute mash. Mash out at 76 for five minutes, giving us our 1055 original gravity. For fer fermentation, I'm using the White Labs WLP001. That's the Chico strain. That's the strain that Sierra Nevada are using. It's a straight 14 day, 20 degree fermentation. Now, as I said, this recipe is based on the Sierra Nevada recipe that they've shared on their website. I'm certainly hoping that I can do it justice and produce a beer that's pretty close to the original. So because I got this recipe from Sierra Nevada's website, and because we're making a Sierra Nevada brew, I'm not normally one to follow instructions 100%, but in this case, I'm willing to make an exception. Step one in their process is open a Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. Step one complete. Oh, wow. That is a lovely hoppy pale ale. Not IPA levels of hop, but nice and hoppy nonetheless. This recipe kicks in at 38 IBUs. So you're getting into that, that hoppy territory. For me, it's got hints of marmalade. You still get that malt character in there. It's, it's a beautiful pale ale. It's one of the original craft beers that I remember getting when you could when you could eventually get American craft beer in Australia. For years and years, we didn't get a lot of American craft beers over here, but once they started coming in, this was a standard. If I can replicate half of that, I'll be a very happy man. The first step is to take our 10.9 kilos of grist, get it into the water, get it doughed in, get the dough balls out of it, and then start our, our process. Now, because I'm using the Brewzilla Gen 4, I've created a profile for this beer. It is 70 degree mash in. I know that in Brewfather it says 72, but what I find is that the temperatures on these things don't drop as much as Brewfather predicts. I usually find a two, maybe three degree drop. So our strike water has hit 70 degrees. Now, because we've got 50 litres of water in here, I'm not worried about a stuck, getting a stuck sparge. There is plenty of water in there to make sure that we can mix it up and, and get that, 
water flowing through the through the grist. You wouldn't believe it, the temperature's actually gone up. It's gone up to 72. So now I press that button and the profile continues on. So now it's aiming for a target of 68. Normally at this point I would probably put the lid on to try and keep a bit of heat in, but I'm going to leave the lid off to let some of that heat out. So I'm hoping that that drops down. I don't want it to stay up at this temperature for too long. I want it to drop down to 68 degrees. And maybe one thing I can do is just quickly circulate some of that wort through. I normally wouldn't put the pump on for 10 minutes, but I want to get that temperature down. Okay, it's dropping quite quickly now. So I'm just going to leave that while I rinse this off and put the drill back. Oh, there it is, that lovely malt grain smell. Oh, I love that smell. So 10 minutes later, I've turned the pit on. Now I haven't used the pit on this before. So I've set hysteresis, heating hysteresis to zero. I've turned the pit on and I've used a P coefficient of 0.48 and an I coefficient of 0.002. Now I don't know if they're good or not, we'll find out. They're the values I got from uh, a David Heath video. So I couldn't really find too much on, on what recommended settings are, but he seems to have a fairly good explanation. So I've just, adjusted those values uh, well I've taken those values and I'll see how we go on this just put the lid down for a second and I also want to take just a, a manual reading okay so we've got 66 degrees at the top we've got 69 degrees at the bottom so I think if I turn the pump on now it'll keep that wart going through and it'll keep it at a nice 68 degrees so just quickly throw this tube on. Now hint with this is don't put it on too far. If you force it all the way on, it's a bugger to get off. Lid goes on now just to keep some of that heat in. So we don't have to use the heating elements quite so much and pump on. And we've got 47.7 minutes until we finish the mash. And at that point, it's automatically going to raise it up to 77 Celsius for the mash out. Uh, I'll get notifications on my phone every time it hits a, a milestone on here. So I've got stuff to do. I've got a chicken door to, to go and fix. Love this. I don't need to do anything apart from just monitor it every now and again. And again, I can do that through the phone, through the wrapped cloud. I can go onto my phone and make sure that it's hitting its, its temperatures and I can see the graph of how it's doing. I'll just follow this on my phone while I'm doing other jobs around the place and I'll be back in 55 minutes. See you later. We've already exceeded our pre-boil gravity of 1046. The efficiency on this has been great, which is funny because I thought with a bigger mash that the efficiency would drop. Not so. So all I'm going to do is Lean this a bit just to get the last bits of wort out of the grain. And then I'll top up to the pre-boil gravity just with plain water just to bring that um, just to bring that, that gravity down a bit. Okay now bump this up to our boil temp. Okay, we've got the boil starting to happen. So in goes our first addition. 14 grams of cascade. It's only a small addition, but it's a 90-minute addition. Most of the bittering from this comes from the third edition, the 30 minute edition of hops. <clears throat> 60 minute time has gone off, so 21 grams of Cascade hops. 15 minute edition, a workflop tablet and two grams of yeast music. A flame out edition, 110 grams of Cascade. I've upgraded this to a plate chiller. Uh, they're just a little bit more efficient. And yeah, I think they, they'll this will cool down a lot more efficiently than the, um, the, the counter flow. Not that the counter flow was bad. Secondly, I've upgraded to quick disconnects. I think they're a little bit more secure than the cam locks. Obviously have to stick with the cam lock here and I'm sticking with the cam lock on the water inside just so that I can tell which is water and which is wart. 
And finally, I've got myself a little clip to avoid the problem I had last time where this fell out on the brew day from hell, where this fell out and spilled about five litres on the ground. This will clip the return hose onto the side of the brew house, just to make it a little more secure. Okay, so that's just on for five minutes, just to make sure that everything in here, even though it's been cleaned, is bug free. So that there's no contaminants. We're not gonna get an infection from anything that may have been hanging around in the water before. Okay, even air cooling, just like that. So it's just radiating heat away without the water. It's already dropped that down to 90 degrees. Okay, I'm just gonna test the temperature as it comes out. That is so efficient. That's coming out at 21 degrees, so that's pitchable now. The brew belt has been sanitized. Um, every little nook and cranny, the lid, the inside, all the little valves and gauges and, and all that. Uh, so the only thing we need to do is turn the pump off and then bring this over here. Will it reach just and then turn the pump back on? Might need to uh, change the way I do this, get a longer hose. Okay, so we're getting plenty of splashing in there, plenty of aeration. If I'm going to be standing here for five minutes holding this, I might as well enjoy myself. So that's a little over 50 litres. Here's our White Labs WLP001 California Ale Yeast Starter. 2.7 litres. This has been cooking all day. I'm just going to carefully pour it into our fermenter. And I didn't even tip the stir bar in. Just give the hands another spray. Okay, so all the stuff for the pressure fermentation is, has been soaking. The only thing I've changed is I substituted this hose. Of course, the original hose that came with the kit's only about that long. Would only reach down to about there, in my estimation. And because I'm going to dump the tube and dump the yeast, I want to be able to get right down to the very bottom of the fermenter. This came from a, a Kegland floating dip tube kit, as did the filter that I'm going to put on it. So the uh, pressure fermentation kit doesn't come with a filter, unfortunately, but such is life. Luckily, I had a spare kit sitting around. So the filter goes into the dip tube. If you weren't using the filter, only had the float, then that's what you, you put your floating dip tube on. But because I'm using a filter, I'm going to take that piece off and then attach the float. So there's a couple, three different positions you can attach the float. I'm going to attach it here so that the, the filter sits down in, in the wart and the dip tube sits down below it. And as it goes down, it'll eventually hold down like that. But mostly it's going to sit like that. So I'm going to get good uh, filtration through there, down through the, the dip tube. Okay, and since I've been playing with them, I'll just throw them back into the sanitizer. Okay, so the cap has beer out, gas in. Okay, we have these two short dip tubes. The shorter one is the gas. Slightly longer one is for beer. So then we need a post, a poppet valve and a spring. Okay, so the poppet valve goes down into the post. Then the narrow end of the spring goes in first. And because it doesn't have the serrations around there, this is for beer. Okay, pop it valve in first. Then the narrow end of the spring. I was wrong, I was under the impression that these came with an additional um, PRV on them, but they don't. So that's tightened nicely. I'll just throw that back into the sanitizer liquid for a sec. Okay, so there's a little blanking plate there. Okay, again, back into the sanitizer. Okay, we're just about done. So I've got the wrapped pill to go in. Okay, hopefully it can work through all of this stainless steel. I don't know. Let's find out. Let's just see what happens. Now we attach the floating dip tube to the beer port. Again, just a quick dunk in the sanitizer. Cleanliness, sanitization is the best way to success. Take that blanking plate off. And now throw the 
pressure pack on top. So we've got everything set up now. Uh, the only thing I don't have set up is the glycol chiller. It's not going to be needed overnight. Um, it's going to take the, the yeast probably 24 hours to, to really get going, even though it's a starter. I've got the I've got the spunding valve set to six psi, uh, so that's around about where I want to, to ferment this one. Uh, fermenting under pressure will make the yeast produce something a little bit cleaner. Um, I'm not going the full hog, so with my lagers, I usually crank that up to 15, even 20 psi to get a really clean uh, profile. But for this, around about six psi. I'll check the pill in about an hour to see if it's still connecting to the, the rat portal. Hopefully it is, fingers crossed. Otherwise I'm gonna to have to take a couple of manual samples. I'm gonna take one sample now just to check the OG that I got before on the refractometer and see, just see where we're at. 10.55, so we're pretty close to the money. I did notice on the can that it's only 5.0% alcohol. The recipe calls for 5.5. I've calculated this to come out at about 5.6. So swings and roundabouts, really. Now, I didn't use that whole sample. So bottoms up. Oh, apart from the sweetness of the malt, that's a very similar flavor profile to the can. I'm happy with that. Fingers crossed, it turns out to be a great beer. So now it's time for the tasting. So I've just poured myself one of my Sierra Nevada Pale Ale clones. And to do an AB comparison test, I've got a Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. Now straight off, apart from the bad pour, I can see a difference between the two. The Sierra Nevada is clearer than mine. Now, that could, there could be a number of factors there. I did notice that last night when I tried it. It could be down to the fact that I'm using a new brew house and a new fermenter and a new glycol chiller and I haven't quite got the processes right yet. So a little bit more experimentation on that side. The head, actually I think the head on mine is, is slightly better structured than on, this, on the original. The original is already starting to break down, whereas mine's holding quite nicely. It's a little bit moussey. On the nose, I'm getting that malt character. Not a lot of the hop. On the Sierra Nevada. Yeah, a little bit more of the fresh hop. Yeah, there's, there's definitely more hoppiness in the Sierra Nevada than in mine. Now that could be just due to the processes. Again, it's gonna take me a few brews to dial in the new equipment and, and make sure I get the, the right extractions from them. Yeah, definitely more malty, more hoppy. Now, let's try it. Mm. There's definitely that malt characteristic there. It's, it's, there's the hops are there. They're not quite as bright as I remember from the Sierra Nevada. Not a lot of difference though. It's very hard to pick. The only difference that I can pick between the two is that the Sierra Nevada gives me more of that marmalade flavor. This is more, more it's a citrus flavor, but it's not that orange marmalade or grapefruit marmalade. but not a lot of difference between the two. I'll tell you what, it's a hard job, but somebody's got to do it. Yeah, just a little bit more of that marmalade flavor and it could come down to that last hop addition. I don't know, I'll just have to play around. Now that I've done this, I'm very happy with it. I'm going to enjoy it. But the next time I do a pale ale, I'm going to play around with it a little bit. I'm going to, to tweak it, use a, a new hop, and something to give me more of a, a, a tropical flavor. I'm very happy with this beer. If I was to serve that to somebody and tell them that it was a Sierra Nevada Pale Ale, 
I don't think they'd be able to pick the difference apart from the slight cloudiness. An American Pale Ale should be a clear beer, not a, not a slightly hazy beer, but that's all right. I, I, I'll figure that one out. That's it for this episode. Look down into the description because I'm going to include the original Sierra Nevada recipe that I based this on. And I'm also going to provide a link to my Brewfather recipe if you want to try this and, and make it yourself. Remember though to adjust your water profile and your equipment profile so that you get the right values. There are more of these grain to glass episodes coming up. So keep an eye on the channel. Subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell so you find out when there's new content coming out. Like the video, it really helps us out. It lets Google know that this is valuable content and we get out to, to more people. So cheers. Mm -hmm.